Welcome to your Drive Time News Blast. We're calling it what it is, and we're telling it like it is, with 30 minutes of jam-packed, up-to-the-minute news from a perspective of truth, liberty, and justice every weekday. This is Monica Perez. And I'm Brad Binkley. Finally, top of the news, front page, top of the front page of the Wall Street Journal was 9-11. There wasn't much to it, but they finally did acknowledge it. My fear is that if they're not able to use it as the lever they have used it for so well that they need another one, the way they need Trump to be the new Hitler. Eventually, your icons, your your, uh, touchstones lose their magic, and I'm afraid for that. This generation doesn't have one yet, and I think one happens like every generation or so, something like that. Yes, and and they are that – like their metabolism, their their news and digital metabolism is so high, they chew stuff up. Right. So like Pearl Harbor could last for a really long time, but – 9-11 9-11 less so. JFK lasted such a long time as a trauma. Yeah. So, but there, but the ripple effects of 9-11 are still being felt. And the first, obviously, but I mean, as far as a policy manipulator, I was reading, there's a big article in the Wall Street Journal today, and I had told you about this before because it's signs I saw in the airport, but I never heard anybody talk about it. The signs say... If your state has not converted your driver's license to a real ID, like capital R-E-A-L, ID, you need a passport to travel domestically. And this, may, and this was signed in 2005 as a, under the pretense, pretext of 9-11. I feel like you could actually use either of those words. But of 9-11, Bush signed it. And this is the thing that makes me absolutely crazy about that, is the Commerce Clause of the Constitution has been completely overread to the point where it says, like, you can't have commercial barriers between states. And a crazy overreading of that was that a farmer was taxed on food he grew himself and fed his family. I don't know if it was a tax or prohibited from not putting it out in the commercial workplace because him— bypassing commerce was a violation of the commerce clause. I mean, it's crazy. It's used as a sword all the time. Yet here, and I would say if there's any justification for the United States, and you can go back to the Articles of Confederation and you can see it in the in the foundation of the EU, the idea is, the, how it's sold is, you have this right to work, to travel, to trade, across these borders. You don't have to accept the laws, but uh, other laws, irrelevant laws, but the borders are considered open within the framework of this larger entity. So to have this law that you need a passport to travel domestically as a United States citizen that is not in dispute is to me, I, I mean, not that we didn't know the Constitution was dead already, but I would say it is now well and truly dead. And what's it take to get a real ID? Your, I, I don't know what the information that's in it, but there's information embedded in it. Who knows? There might be a tracking thing. I don't know. But your state needs to offer these IDs. And if they started offering them immediately, like in or 10 years ago, you probably would have it. It's got a star in the corner. But oh, yeah. but if you get a five year license, if some states have five year license, some I think some have ten, then if when you got it it wasn't converted, and some states ref- I think some states refused to comply. I think there are a couple of states like that, but their their citizens will be will be discriminated against at airports, which have all been taken over by the federal government, so they're international places now yeah i don't expect to hear much about that during tonight's third democrat debate which is in texas if you're watching the news on this 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 debate is being hyped in the media like it's a long-awaited much anticipated heavyweight battle between two top candidates joe biden and elizabeth warren joe biden being 75 years old elizabeth warren being 70 years old so if that title bout doesn't get you excited then check your pulse (laughs) 
<laughs> you got to check their pulses. Check their pulses. I think Bernie Sanders is up there, too. They might have to stop me? to get the defibrillator out. Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are flanking Joe Biden on the debate stage. They like to play the optics here. They got <laughs> Joe Biden smashed in between the male and female version of the progressive that represents the Democrat Party. Joe Biden being the— Being the Republican. Yeah, Joe Biden being <laughs> the establishment-backed— Moderate versus Elizabeth Warren being the progressive wing who has just basically stolen Bernie Sanders talking points and is going to be fighting Joe Biden for supremacy of the Democrat Party. Will Joe Biden's lead continue to shrink? Can Elizabeth Warren rise up and show herself to be electable? This is the story they're presenting anyway. And since they're presenting the story like this, these are the questions they will answer after the debate. So we already know what the narrative afterwards is going to be. And they'll have the one thing where they say, which candidate maybe built some momentum or had the craziest line. Maybe it'll be Andrew Yang because Andrew Yang has- He's still there. He's still there. Yeah, he made it. (laughs) He promised something crazy. And the first couple of debates, the crazy thing he did was he did not wear a tie. Oh, my gosh. Right. And they still let him come back? I think he should up that a little bit. He should wear a tie, but he should wear a button-down shirt with all of the buttons unbuttoned, his chest exposed, and he should not address it at all. He should be super serious <laughs> because that's the kind of attention he needs to get to steal away from these much older candidates. But they're making it out to be like— Like, this is going to be the fall of Joe Biden, and I I think this is a part of the narrative where Elizabeth Warren takes that baton, where she gets to be the front runner for a little while. It was Kamala Harris. It was Biden. I think it's going to be Elizabeth Warren for a little while. Yes, they always do that. They cycle through. They switch through. But what this really is, though, they, this isn't a debate. These are never debates. And that's, I think that's – for me, that's the most important thing to remember is right. this is 10 people who are delivering basically the exact same talking points in different language that appeals to their respective demographics. So Sometimes they get assigned – yeah. One a talking point each yeah. just to make sure that everybody hears it. And for her, she introduced a policy or suggested a policy, maybe even just like today or yesterday, which is the the one thing that I just always thought was so totally unfair. She kind of wants to transition Social Security more and more into a welfare program so that the people, the poorest people get more and the people, the richest people get pay more. So ultimately, with Social Security, the more you work, the more you earn, the more you pay in, and the more you should get back at the end. It's like a pension plan, supposedly. Yeah. But if they – I was always afraid after – I've put a lot of money into Social Security because I did work for a long time, even when it hurt to pay that money in. But then, you you know, as you get older, if you do better, they will means test it and then – I will get nothing, even though I put a lot in, and I may even have to pay the taxes for it, which is kind of outrageous. And if you look at the federal budget, how much of the federal budget goes to Social Security? I mean, it would, it's, a, it's really the suggestion is a massive welfare program. Right. And, she, and uh, yeah, she's yeah, been yeah. going further and further, Bernie Sanders, in her programs because for some reason she's – I guess, more electable than Bernie Sanders is. But they're basically like best friends that rip off the same talking points. And I think tonight the clear winner is going to be the progressive talking points because the stage has mostly progressives on it with Joe Biden kind of put in the middle. So they're going to be repeating those same themes over and and over again. It's going to be the equivalent of messaging bills. So she doesn't have to win for that policy. Exactly. To be part of the platform. Yeah. So what this is, is it's not about debating. It's about indoctrinating the audience further in these these uh, socialist type ideas and in the perception of Trump, because this debate is being held in Texas, where the most <laughs> recent white nationalist uh, related shooting has occurred. Right. And it's being held at a all black historic college. And we're right on the heels of 9-11 during the resistance's defund hate week. I think it's safe to say everybody on stage is going to repeatedly agree that Donald Trump is a racist whose immigration policies are bigoted and designed to keep people of color out of this country. And I think we're going to hear a lot about voter suppression because Stacey Abrams will be watching. And how can they stay away? Given that setup, how can they stay away from the gun issue? I mean, that's definitely right, going to be exactly. a big thing. And the the Congress and the Senate are all being bombarded with all this new legislation that everybody's behind. The Republicans are behind, you know, some things, the red flag laws, Trump wants background checks. But one thing that is that is 
such a demonstration of something I was talking about yesterday, the corpo governmental continuum, is that 100, depending on which letter it was, I think like 140 or 150 CEOs signed this letter urging the Senate to pass these background check enhancements. These are like Levi Strauss, The Gap, uh, Condé Nast. There's some that may have a purpose to it, like Dix might, you know, they want regulations on selling guns. Dix and Walmart, they might like that because that means little guys will never be able to jump those bars and their market share of the gun market would go up. But what bothers me about this is that if you if you want to think about the inherent justice of a free market capitalist system, you look at where, where if you want to negate the concept, the Marxist concept of labor being oppressed, look at this like a, a real functioning stock market. You're a laborer. As you get older and better at it, you you can command higher wages. And as you get paid out, you pay your house down, whatever, and then you have a little extra money. You take that and you put it in shares of stock. And you can, for as little as a dollar, participate in the capital of your own company. Sometimes they give you stock. So you would have some power there or at least some independent wealth. And what they do is they take that. They take that contribution of everyone and they put at the top, oftentimes, in my opinion, a politician who did not actually build that company and may not have ever contributed or invested anything in that company, but they're because they're connected to the government and they can lobby for good regulations and whatever, that justifies the board selecting that CEO. And what that guy does, sometimes he's just a figurehead and the COO runs the company. But what that guy does then is does what these guys did, which it, one of the quotes in the letter is that uh, this is in order to fulfill the obligation to the communities we serve by keeping them safe. Now, I can see why Uber might say that if they think that there's more danger. You know, taxi drivers, anyway, are at greater risk of, of gun crimes, I think. But they just, they co-opt your money as a consumer, but also your opportunity as an investor. And not only does it use it for political purposes you might not like, it perforce reduces your return. Because when they start, focusing on things other than maximizing profit for the company, then they are diverting some of the profits to something else. I absolutely hate what's called stakeholder stuff. I hate it. I hate CEOs being political. Yeah. Is that is that my bully pulpit, my <laughs> soapbox for the for the day? But they don't they don't they don't want to just control guns for all you millennials out there who might be in favor of gun control. They all also want to control your vaping. Absolutely. A lot of vaping alarmism has been in the news the past couple of days. I know. And I have a very significant theory, and I think you do too. I want, But we haven't compared I do, notes. Yeah. So I know it's on your list of stuff to talk about. I'm very interested in what you, what co- what you think cracking the code was on that one. Yeah. Let's see. You go first. You go first. If, oh, you want me, me to go first? I want you to go first. All right. Well, obviously, there's been an onslaught of vaping news. CNN really set it off for me with their story last night that had a teenager in a hospital bed with tubes coming out of his nose. It looked like he's oh, unconscious. Oh, I saw that picture. Yeah, and it said – It's everywhere. After vaping, he now has the lungs the of a 70-year-old. Yes. I mean this is atrocity propaganda is what it totally. is. Totally. And, and there's been stories about how people are trying to quit vaping because of the, this, and they're terrified their lungs are going to explode. But they're unable to because they're addicted. And what's really peculiar about the story is that both the left and the right, both Donald Trump and Don Lemon, agree on what the solution should be. That's a red flag. Exactly. <laughs> and that solution to this youth teen vaping epidemic, they're calling it, is that they need to eliminate the flavored vaping from the market altogether. Just get rid of it because everybody knows that what the teens are addicted to is the flavors and not the nicotine. So it makes no sense whatsoever. But this legislation, what it would do, according to the Vaping Association, is it would get rid of something like 10,000 small businesses and jewel the biggest one. It would prop (laughs) up jewel who (laughs) says that – it's going to hurt them, but Jewel actually came out and said, "You know what? We're going to we're we're happy to push the aggressive legislation, and we're going to abide by it." Of course, you are, because all the other companies are going to be gone. I can't believe that 
that your code that there was just this one we both came to the same conclusion usually there's like a multifaceted framework or, or network of things that are coming out of these really highly hyped stuff so you yeah. and I can come out come at it from totally different angles and be equally insightful yeah. incisive but uh this this I totally am on the same page there are a couple of other aspects of it that Well can I just finish one Yeah thing? go ahead I, before you move on let me just this was the tortured tortured paragraph in the Wall Street Journal, I had to read it a few times, and and just uh, because I know that what you're saying is true, because a friend of the show and a high ranking member of the WSB family pointed out to me, said, "I was like, oh, I'm really sorry for you. I know they're going to take away your donuts or whatever it is." And uh, he said, "Oh, it's big tobacco and Jewel." I was like, "Jewel? How uh-huh. could Jewel be behind it?" And he didn't elaborate because he's a working guy and doesn't have time to text me all morning. So I just put my thinking cap on <laughs> or in any case, put those, those, uh, those glasses on when I read this article. So, uh, forgive me, but I have to say it says an entire generation of children risk becoming addicted to nicotine. Mr. Azar said, he said it would take the FDA several weeks to put out the final guidance on the new policy. Listen to this. Then, after a 30-day period, all e-cigarettes except for tobacco-flavored products would have to be removed from the market. Okay. This is where the, wor- the, the grammar might be the tell. Manufacturers of tobacco-flavored e-cigarettes may continue to sell their products, but must apply by May 2020 for an FDA review. Juul is a tobacco-flavored yeah. product. Mm-hmm. But the people who just sell the flavors don't sell the commodity generic tobacco. Yeah. They only sell flavors. Because they all target children. Well, regardless. <laughs> I mean, maybe they do. I mean, but then it says manufacturers of – makers of other e-cigarette flavors can also apply for FDA authorization, right. but – their products would be off the market pending the review. Yeah. You don't even have to, you could even rule in their favor, but 30 days into that, they would all be bankrupt. There would be no coming back from it. I'm not saying they would all be, but you would really, Uh you really imagine taking, bringing their revenue, a, a struggling startup, bringing the revenue down to zero for an indefinite period. I mean, what guy who even owns it himself put his lifeblood into it is going to take his last pennies of savings to prop that up pending a completely corrupted FDA review? Yeah, this is it's legislation. Genius. It is, it is, it really is. It's legislation that eliminates almost all of the smaller competition while removing none of the clientele because they're addicted now this has been shown kids are still going to get it even if they still wanted the flavors you know who's going to buy up all the flavored ones or who buy from other drug dealers and they're going to get them to the kids a lot if you read the these stories a lot of these additives i mean some of them are thc and stuff a lot of the additives are bootlegs that's the other part of the story right they are black market stuff already and that kind of stuff then you've got real profits so that market is going to be taken up that's and they'll just hack into the into the the cartridges and add this stuff the nearly all of the illnesses that have been attributed to to vaping the person who was vaping was vaping black market THC. So this legislation would do oh, nothing really? to prevent that's what they have what they suspected, but they're not talking about. It. They're being very No, they don't vague talk about, about that because of it. that wouldn't be affected not one bit at all by the proposed regulations. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Not As at a all. matter of fact, it would make it much, much worse. Yes, and it goes even deeper. And I do have a couple of recommendations. And then the for THC people. stuff is gonna be donut flavored. And yeah. then the kids are gonna be like Oh, is it donut? Yeah, but it's got THC, but not a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's the nicotine and the weed that they're addicted because to. Because the guy who's going to break open the cartridges or insert in the cartridges, why not do both? Yeah, who cares? At the same time, not have like two – I don't have to open his trench coat and have different selections. You know, that's not as likely. Yeah, for people who are worried about it, the recommendations from the American Council of Science and Health, they say vaping devices should be thought of as medical devices meant to help quitting smoking, and to never add any anything to a vaping device other than the liquid provided by a manufacturer. So that's uh, what they say to Oh, keep so safe. they can just – they don't even have to bust into it. The liquid is added into the – like you get liquid? 
You get black you market buy, liquid. I've never vaped. Yeah. You don't buy the thing that looks like a USB loaded. You load it. Yeah, you load it. You oh, buy the so liquid. So then there's you buy the absolutely yeah. no. I could I could probably by the end of today figure out how to make that liquid. Yeah, myself. you can figure. You, can, you mean, do have tutorials, I'm sure. Now, the part of the story which I think really might interest you is one: the cigarette companies own the, the vaping own companies. Jewel. Yeah, own. Oh, Jewel. they do. Yeah. I saw one owner of Jewel, but I didn't recognize. Thirty-five oh, percent. But yes, that's the company. the company that's merging with Philip Morris. Yeah, owns Jewel. <laughs> so it's not it's not vaping against cigarettes. They're working oh, together. So the number funny. two company, which is I think V U S E, is owned by the Reynolds. The yeah, this company. is Altria and Philip Morris. Yes. Oh, that's so funny. And and actually, they're taking a page from the Marlboro playbook because in the 70s, Marlboro – I could never verify this, but I recall distinctly reading it a long time ago – was that Marlboro lobbied to get marketing – tobacco marketing banned yeah. because they had such a huge market right, share. Right, they got it, yeah. They didn't want – someone to just put up a billboard that said, oh – no, donut flavor. Yeah, exactly. Jewel has spent the first part of this year spending $1. million lobbying the White House and lobbying D.C. And not only that, the previous two years, their annual lobbying meeting in 2017 and 2018 has been held in Washington, D.C. Do you have a guess at what hotel it was ha, held ha, at? Ha. The old post office? The Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. <laughs> is where the lobbying events were held. And not only that... <laughs> <laughs> Included among those who work for Jewel oh are a former Obama staffer, as well as several former former officials who worked in Trump's White House, including two of his former counsels who left the White House and moved on to go work at Jewel. I have to say, I don't want to belabor this topic. We should move on. But I have to say, I quit smoking after many years of smoking. I read this great book, The Easy Way to Stop Smoking. It was great, and I realized then substitutes make no sense at all. Just do not do it. But I resisted quitting for a long, long time. Uh -huh. Even when I had babies, like I didn't smoke when I was pregnant or had like was nursing, but I just started again. Yeah. But the first of all, the thing that really got me to – well, I shouldn't say a lot of different things, but just it was so hard to smoke anywhere. So th it was going away. Like vaping has resuscitated it. And the other thing, and this is why I hate government health care, is I had quit smoking, and then I got life insurance after I had kids, and then I guess I sneaked a cigarette. I've told you this before. And I got – I tested positive for nicotine, and I believe they suspended my life insurance policy. I don't wow. think they just raised the rates. I think they suspended it for like one, two, or three years. Wow. And I then I was like, oh, I can't do unhealthy things where my premiums will go through the roof or I can't get – you know, they because insurance does not work if you have control over the outcome and there are no consequences for that. So if you're a reckless driver, your insurance has to go up because they can't have you say, oh, I'm suicidal and I want my wife to get the money, so I'm just going to drive like a maniac. They can't let you control the outcome that pays out. Insurance requires that you have no control over the thing that is being insured. And then, as another level, they have to isolate you into a risk pool, somebody who's super risky. So a 30-year-old getting life insurance is not that big a deal. For them, but a 70 year old is. So, a 70 year old and a 30 year old should never be in the same risk pool because the 70 year old has to pay way more. He's going to pay other 70 year olds out. That's how it works. Yeah. And that's why, like, the Obamacare thing doesn't work. They're putting everybody in the same risk pool and they don't care that you have, they don't penalize you for doing things that are within your control. Like, well, maybe they do a little, but they, because of the way the subsidies work, it's not like a one to one. And I'm just saying, smoking, I, I, I had wanted to get that point out about, other you know numerous times before but the fact is smoking was on the way out and yeah. now vaping brought it back with a vengeance yeah can i say one quick thing about the vaping yeah, yeah. they have also just entered the largest market in the world of addicted smokers china china, china. Yeah. they've entered the chinese market this is why both the left and the right agree on it because it's making both of them rich by putting this legislation in because they're both working with that company i wonder how much they care about, like, if if we had eradicated smoking, would that have been, like, hard for them to sell the vaping then, like, to China? Good like, question. You don't, you yeah. don't vape. 
why should we vape? We're just going to quit. Yeah. I don't know. Right. But, uh, but the, I did want to give on international, other international news, I did want to give an update on Brexit. So the court came out, like we talked about yesterday, and said you know, a court that wasn't necessarily like the court to make this decision that Boris Johnson shouldn't have prorogued parliament for political purposes, yada, yada. Then I read in the last sentence of the article about it in the Wall Street Journal that the prorogation didn't really make any difference anyway, probably wouldn't make any difference anyway or this court case because the party conferences like the RNC, DNC are all going on right now. So all those guys, like this is probably a very slow month in parliament since they're all at their party conferences. But one thing they did put out was Brexit, the government said they put out, they were forced to reveal a case scenario they ran, worst case scenario, which they ran it, they said, just to hyper-focus people on preparation that they don't think it's a real case at all, but they were forced to release it, which, of course, is panicking the public. And what they're saying, and this, I actually reached out to British JJ. There are two JJs in our yeah. tweep world. British JJ, to make sure I'm thinking about this right, so I'm going to wait to hear back from him. But the worst-case scenario says that there would be food, fuel, and medicine shortages because of backup backups at customs entering the country. And I thought, the UK doesn't need a deal with the EU to phase in customs. Yeah. Like, they could just leave the border and say, oh, well, we're the UK now. You can, you can open your borders to products. You know what I mean? They could phase it in over time. They don't have to say, oh... We're the UK, not the EU now. Don't don't give us your medicine. They could just say, oh, we're going to let it come in. If you don't let our stuff go into you, well, that's your business. But you don't need a deal to suspend your own customs requirements or continue your policy of favoring the EU until <laughs> – you know what I mean? Yeah. So it seems like a very contrived thing. And uh, And then the kicker, though, of the article I was reading on this was Bojo says – the no deal thing is just, wait for it, a negotiating tactic. Oh, just like Trump. Boris, he, he Boris Johnson Trump. Truly the Trumpian. The deal the maker in the UK. The Trumpian of the they UK. They really are doing those parallels hardcore. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's laughable. Next thing you know, he's going to have a long tie and a beautiful wife, which he does have a beautiful wife. Oh, is she an immigrant? I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, he looks foreign to me. He he he's like Swedish or something. He does not look British. Yeah, he kind of does look Swedish. So yeah, and he was born in the United States. I have to point out. Was he really? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. At Mar-a-Lago, is that where Boris Johnson was born? Yes, I think Jeffrey Epstein was his father. Oh wow! wow. <laughs> no, his father was some like CIA guy or <laughs> I didn't know. He was working on population control studies or. Something like that. I should uh, Stanley, I think his name was something like that in Connecticut, and uh, they were in and out of the U.S. But he was born in the U.S. That's interesting. Okay. So I have a quick hit with fun with numbers. A Pew study that came out came yesterday, a survey found that 56 percent of Americans trust the United States law enforcement agencies to use facial recognition technology responsibly. Now I don't know who were among the people in that study, but it must have been a group of people who were all law enforcement officials because that is kind of crazy to me. Now, further in the study, they found that only 36% trusted the tech companies with the facial recognition technology, while only 18% trusted advertisers. So they trust Jim Comey, but they don't trust Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, and I'm like the opposite. I think I'm fine with advertisers. If they're doing it just to sell me stuff that I want, I, I'm not saying it couldn't be corrupted, but if that is the purpose, I don't care. But I do start to care when it's a an information collecting organization or a monopoly on violence organization. This, I'm the exact yeah. opposite progression. The CIA's job description is espionage. The FBI, the CIA have <laughs> lied to us repeatedly recently and throughout history. And yet, yeah, 56 percent. Yeah, give them facial recognition. I trust them. Sure. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? That blows my mind. <laughs> 
Google. Go ahead. Let's finish up with okay. the other stuff. Google has banned ads for unproven medical treatments, and this is going to affect like stem cell clinics that are not regulated, gene therapies, probably gene editing. And I think that this is, I I. I anticipated that once gene editing started to actually solve some people's problems because there's these biohackers who are doing it in their garage. They're, they're like trying to make themselves superhuman and solving some problems that they were going to regulate it and they were going to try to prevent people from being able to do it themselves. And I think this is another part of that. I have I, – I, I am really – was blown away by a book I'm reading called The Global Censorship of Health Information mm. that the FDA – suppresses true things on purpose this guy says so oh, yeah a great writer mm. it, he they say it's in service of like big pharma yep. but the example he gives was a case he won which uh, repeat had to fight and fight fight for enforcement fight for everything the fda was actively suppressing the information that folic acid taken by pregnant women or pre-pregnant women reduces the ca- the risk of spina bifida by a significant amount and they knew it the evidence was there they did not want it and they they fought tooth and nail to suppress that information so there is suppression of valid medical information out there without any any process of integrity to evaluate it and he talks about it from a free speech perspective it's complete it's called prior restraint which is a total violation of the First Amendment. Spina bifida is when the head is really small when they come out? I think, no, that's encephaly, microencephaly. Uh, microencephalitis or anencephaly, when they don't have a brain at all. No, spina bifida is when the spinal column, I believe, is not is formed in part outside the vertebrae or vertebrae are missing. So your spinal column is uh, vulnerable and... It doesn't function. It's a very serious birth defect. To that point, and we'll wrap it up, there is a book that opens up with the first chapter about 10 cures that have been suppressed throughout history. And one of the cures it talks about is a guy, he was a Navy doctor. I believe his name was Dr. Becker, maybe Daniel Becker. He basically figured out how to regenerate limbs. And he almost won a Pulitzer Prize for it. And once he figured it out, lost all of his funding, he could not do any of his research anymore, and he was regulated to the outskirts of the country in Mexico. His book is called Body Electric, where he talks about how he does it. Medical suppression is a very real thing. The case of the midwife toad, Paul Kammerer, disproved Darwin in favor of Lamarck in 1925, and he got a bullet in the back of the head to <laughs> to suppress that. They say it was suicide, even though, ha-ha, like it actually says in the footnote, the angle of entry was impossible for a person to inflict on himself, but that was just another one of his clever little scientific manipulations. I think we will wrap it up there. You can find your drive time. You, ah, you can find drive time news blast every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. on the propreport.com or your favorite podcasting platform underneath Propaganda Report podcast feed. We will talk to you tomorrow.